for joining us today for Dear Abby, inmate number 3225101, Building a Correspondence Program. My name is Desiree Magsimble, Senior Program Officer at Just Attention International in the LA office, and I will be moderating today's webinar. JDI is a health and human rights organization that works to end sexual violence in all forms of detention. JDI has three core goals for its work. To hold government officials accountable for rape in prison, by promoting public attitudes that value the health and safety of inmates, and to ensure that survivors of rape in prison get the help that they need. It is our fundamental belief that when the government takes away someone's freedom, it takes on the absolute responsibility to protect that person's safety. No matter what crime someone has committed, rape is not part of the penalty. We know that sexual abuse is not an inevitable part of prison life. Prisons and jails with committed leaders, good policies, and sound practices can keep inmates safe. We would like to take a moment to thank the Office of Violence Against Women for its generous support of this webinar and our larger project called No Bad Victims, Support for Incarcerated Survivors. During today's webinar, we're going to be sharing some quotes and stories from survivors of sexual abuse and detention. Some of these may be graphic and might be upsetting and difficult to hear. Please take care of yourselves. This webinar will be recorded, so you'll have an opportunity to revisit it later if necessary. Okay, so just a few things before we get started. Um, so I just want to just, if we have any uh, similar technical issues as we did last time, which we don't anticipate, um, but in case, please hold on the line while we uh, call in uh, from our phones, and that will only take about 30 seconds. We've made this webinar very interactive with lots of polls and activities. You'll be able to select your answers from each poll on the screen. We'll guide you through them as they come up. For open-ended activity questions, you could submit your answers in the question box on the right side of your screen. You can also use the same box to submit any of your own questions and comments throughout the webinar. A closed caption recording of this webinar will be posted on our website in the next few days. We'll send you some more information later today, including a link to an evaluation for your feedback. You'll find the slides for today's webinar and the publication Hope Behind Bars, an advocate's guide to helping survivors of sexual abuse and detention under the handout section on the right side of your screen. We have a wide range of other resources available on our website. We'll review those in more detail at the end of today's webinar. Rape and other forms of sexual abuse, whether committed in the home, the community, or in prison, have serious emotional and physical consequences. However, the, mo the vast majority of rape survivors behind bars have very limited access to services. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics research, among survivors of abuse and detention, only one in ten has ever received assistance from a counselor and even fewer enrolled in the treatment following the sexual assault. This lack of access to support or protection means that incarcerated survivors are likely to be victimized repeatedly, with each assault adding a new layer of emotional and physical trauma that impairs their ability to serve their time safely and to return successfully to their families and communities. But through written correspondence, you can help. Letters are still the main way that prisoners communicate with the outside world. JDI receives more than 50 letters each week from survivors, many of whom are looking for referrals, help getting to safer housing, or managing their feelings. Many just want to share their story with a compassionate witness. For survivors who do not feel safe disclosing the abuse to correction staff or their loved ones, letters to an outside organization may feel like the safest way to reach out for help. Today, we'll be offering guidance on how to work with survivors in custody through written correspondence. You will hear from two of JDI's staff members who have a great wealth of experience responding to survivors in detention. First, you'll hear from Bo Smith. Bo Smith is a program associate at Just Detention. She provides research and administrative assistance to JDI's domestic program team. Bo, who spent 29 years in prison before her release in 2012, has been an outspoken advocate for inmates' rights. While in prison, Bo served as a PREA and HIV AIDS peer educator, teaching inmates about their rights to be free from sexual violence. She was also actively engaged and founded a survivor support group. Bo is a member of JDI's Survivor Council, and she joined in November 2012. You will also be hearing from Jessica Seipel. Jessica is a senior program officer at JDI. As part of the domestic team, Jessica supports corrections agencies and community rate crisis centers in developing partnerships to provide services for incarcerated survivors. Jessica also provides training and technical assistance to rape crisis advocates and correction staff. 
Previously, she worked for community rape crisis centers, domestic violence programs, and sexual health agencies across California. Jessica is enrolled in the graduate public health program at George Washington University. So you should have received a link to a short video called My Name is Joe. We sent the link today and last week. In case you didn't get a chance to watch the video, here's a quote from Joe. Jessica was my advocate when I was assaulted. She was the person that said it wasn't my fault. That was a turning point for me. As soon as she told me, I know you've been raped, I knew without a doubt, without any, she could have never said another word to me. At that point, I knew I hadn't done this. So for those of you who are able to watch the video ahead of time, let's take a short quiz. For those of you who haven't been able to watch it, I encourage you to do it after the webinar today. Uh, you'll find the link on, to the video on the question box on the right side of your screen. Okay, so in the video, so which feelings and experiences did Jessica mention that were the same for working with survivors behind bars and survivors in the community? Okay, and some of your responses. Okay, so feelings of self-blame, feelings of shame and guilt, shame, isolation, blame. Great, shame and guilt. We have a lot of responses from everybody. Thank you. In the video, Jessica specifically mentioned self-blame, fear, and trauma. Similar to survivors in the community, incarcerated survivors of sexual assault also experience a wide range of reactions. As you all know, there is no standard response to sexual assault, and this is true for incarcerated survivors as well. Okay, so we're also going to launch a poll. So the question is, what was Jessica's primary means of communication with Joe? Then I'll, take, I'll give you a moment to respond. Okay. And it looks like the vast majority of you said written correspondence, and that's correct. D is the correct answer. Jessica was referred to, oh, sorry, Joe was referred to Jessica's organization after the result. All their communication was through written correspondence. So next, we'll take a look at some of the basics of providing support through written correspondence. But first, I want to start with a quote from Bo. For prisoners, getting mail is a form of hope, a connection to the outside. Getting a letter reminds the prisoners that they are not forgotten. So now I'd like to hand it over to Bo Smith, Program Associate at Just Detention International. Thank you, Desiree. Good morning or afternoon for everyone. Uh, before we get started, we would like to hear from you. Why is correspondence important for incarcerated survivors? Please submit your answers in the question box on the right side of your screen. Connection. Connection to someone who cares. To decrease isolation, support, maintain connection to outside world is often our only option for communicating. Um, I feel supported and um, decrease isolation, show they're not alone, let them know that they, uh, we believe in them uh, so they don't feel alone, give more options of, uh, and potentially more privacy than having uh, an advocate in person would, connection to, caring, to a caring person. Awesome. These are all great responses. So now let's talk about a few reasons why correspondence services is one way you can begin meeting the needs of incarcerated survivors. Written correspondence services are accessible, cost efficient, and can be just as effective as in-person or hotline services. Um, it is something rape crisis centers can do as they work to build capacity to provide a full range of services for incarcerated survivors. Correspondence is accessible because prisoners' rights to receive mail are protected by the First Amendment. No one can legally restrict a prisoner's ability to write anyone as long as the letters follow the institutional rules. And a prisoner can even write when they're in, uh, in solitary confinement. 
As Desiree mentioned earlier, letter writing is the major form of communication for prisoners. Because of the high cost of phone calls and the often remote locations of the prisons, mail is the primary way prisoners contact people on the outside. A prisoner or advocate can write at any time, even if the Rape Crisis Center does not have a relationship or written agreement with the corrections facility. Also, a prisoner can write to an ad advocate for anything from emotional support to requests for advocacy, uh, whether the abuse happened in the facility or was in the community before they were incarcerated. The PREA standards require that each facility provide inmates with access to outside victim advocates for emotional support related to sexual abuse by giving inmates mailing addresses and telephone numbers, including toll-free hotline numbers, where available. In comparison to all other victim services, hotline and investigative interview accompaniment, in-person follow-ups, counseling, and hotlines, correspondent services is the most affordable option. Prisoners making inmate wages and working class families that support them struggle to afford the cost of phone calls. Envelopes and paper are more available than most resources, and if a prisoner has no money or family support, many facilities provide a limited amount of stamps, envelopes, and paper each month. For the Rape Crisis Center or Community Service Agency, the cost in addition to staff time is the envelope, paper, and postage. Here at JDI, we have staff de dedicated to answering mail from survivors all over the country, and we get about 50 letters a week. Depending on the service area of the Rape Crisis Center or how many incarcerated survivors are contacting your organization, you can develop a staffing plan that best meets your organization's needs. Some programs may decide to have one person or volunteer solely dedicated to responding to letters, and others may integrate the responsibility into other case management or crisis intervention services. Um, to leverage additional resources, similar to your hotlines, you can have your volunteers or interns respond to letters. It is Simple and it is a simple and convenient way to provide services to incarcerated survivors while still providing effective advocacy and emotional support. While it is ideal to offer equivalent services to people incarcerated, it may not be feasible to provide the same level of service. For many advocates, going into prison to provide services can be a very daunting ex experience. It can be very time consuming and other barriers such as distance and work workload can be a challenge. Written correspondence is a way to help survivors that is both sustainable and effective. Through written correspondence, advocates can uh, emphasize empowerment through basic information, including the person's rights under PREA. Reinforce the right to bodily integrity and provide strategies to risk reduction in a way that doesn't blame the victim. Providing information is empowering. When survivors know that they have a right to be safe and a right to seek help and know how to do that, more will feel entitled to reach out um, for help. So we're going to launch a poll. Um, what types of services um, are you already providing for incarcerated survivors? And I'll just wait a minute while you um, answer the poll. Oh, wow, we've got a lot going on here. Oh, this is amazing. OK, wow. OK, thank you for your responses. So we have 41% of in-person counseling, 41% of hospital court accompaniment, 56% of hotline, 46% written correspondence, and 20% not yet providing services. This is awesome. Thank you. So it looks like a majority of people are providing these services. This is great. Much of what we will talk about today can also be applied to other types of services that, are your, that you are providing. If you are not yet providing services to incarcerated survivors, we hope that this information that we share with you today will assist you in your efforts. Here are a few basic ideas to consider if you are thinking of building a more formal correspondence program. You can begin with conversations with your staff and board to make sure everyone is on the same page. 
You may want to update policies or develop new policies, specifically around responding to incarcerated survivors through written correspondence. Think about what your staff need to learn, how you might modify current trainings or add more material. Once you have your team, then you can put together thoughtful templates that capture your agency's framework and approach um, to providing services. Be sure to connect with corrections agencies during your planning process. Maybe you are a resource and providing this service to people who are incarcerated helps corrections agencies stay in compliance with PREA. Now I'm going to hand it off to Jessica who will talk about how to screen and assess letters. Thank you, Bo. Um, so while most advocates interact every day with survivors who have provided sexual abuse, who have experienced sexual abuse in the community, it can be a struggle for your organization to provide the services that many of these survivors need. Often, incarcerated survivors will also have complex needs, making providing adequate assistance to them even more challenging. Because they may seem to need more or different services than sexual assault survivors in the community, these conversations raise some difficult questions for advocates on how to respond to letters from incarcerated survivors, such as, what is the role of my agency in serving these survivors? What can I do when there is no help available? What is beyond my capacity? How will I cope with the experience of working with incarcerated survivors and the exposure to the different types of trauma they experience? In this next section, we will look at some basic approaches to responding to letters from incarcerated survivors. Much of what makes advocacy effective with sexual assault survivors in the community is also beneficial to incarcerated survivors. There are, however, often subtle differences in advocacy with incarcerated survivors. It may require advocates to be more observant of survivor thoughts and feelings they express and to be more knowledgeable about interpreting those feelings. It might also mean that advocates take extra steps to ensure that referrals are relevant and accessible and facilitate coordination of services across community agencies. Part of needs assessment also means addressing your organization's service limitations. Work to identify needs, but also understand what you can assist with and what you can't. Researching other resources for referrals is important, but remember that you are a resource as well. Unlike in the community, you will not be able to address a crisis immediately. However, written correspondence can be an opportunity to validate feelings and trauma responses in a very thoughtful way. Even though you can't have a conversation like you would in person or over the phone, your correspondence can be a tool a survivor can return to in a time of crisis. More active interventions may be necessary to help incarcerated survivors cope with crisis reactions they may have to multiple traumas, such as cutting themselves, suicidal thinking and attempts, or other self-harming behavior. JDI regularly receives letters from survivors who threaten to hurt themselves or someone else, or who describe an imminent threat to their safety. Rape crisis centers should decide how to respond to such letters on a case-by-case -case basis. Refer to your agency policies, professional standards, and state guidelines to determine whether it is necessary to break confidentiality. Agency should identify the person who is best equipped to intervene in such cases, such as someone who works in the facility's medical or mental health department or the PREA coordinator. If you believe that a client or anyone else in the facility is in danger, you should consider speaking directly with the facility uh, head or an investigator. If the person under threat is a minor, you might make contact with the state's Child Protective Services Agency. We will talk more about limitations of confidentiality later, but as in every case involving confidentiality, advocates should respond in a way that ensures their client's safety while minimizing any violation of that person's privacy. Many incarcerated people have a long history of complex trauma experiences prior to incarceration, including past instances of sexual abuse. And the experience of being incarcerated is dehumanizing and can be traumatizing, particularly for survivors. It is important to remember that each incarcerated survivor contacting a rape crisis center or other agency serving survivors has a unique perspective of these realities. Their culture will also impact their perspective of their experiences both how they are affected by the violence and by the way in which they seek and use services. For example, we know from male survivors in the community that cultural pressures of masculinity can make it difficult for them to come forward. Some incarcerated survivors who are men 
may reach out asking for help for someone else, not mentioning that he has also been abused or harassed. This can be a way to protect their privacy or ask for help without having to disclose if they aren't ready. These requests should be handled similarly to any other request for information and support. For advocacy to be based on the perspectives and needs of incarcerated survivors, it must be flexible, skilled, and responsive to survivors from diverse cultural experiences. It is also important to note that the PREA standards address abuse in detention and abuse prior to incarceration differently. So next we're going to do a brief exercise to illustrate the unique experience of an incarcerated survivor. I'm going to read the first part of a survivor letter. As I'm reading, listen for what type of abuse this person has experienced. My name is Lewis Edwards and I got your address from the law library here. It said that you can help people who have been raped in prison. That hasn't happened to me really, but I've seen a lot of bad things here. The COs don't care about us. They treat us like animals. Whenever it's time for a search, I know it's going to be bad. They search me in front of other inmates all the time and are always making jokes about me. Sometimes they search me for too long and it feels wrong. See, the thing is, I'm a gay man and the COs know it. When they search me, they talk about how I must like it and laugh at me when I tell them I don't. The other men here see it and get in on the jokes and harass and bully me. So we're going to open up um, another poll. Um, based on what you just heard, what type of abuse did this writer experience? So we have A, sexual harassment, B, rape, C, staff misconduct, D, abuse in the community, or E, A and C. So I'll give you all a bit of time to uh, fill in your answers here. Okay. Wow, okay, overwhelmingly we have people who responded with E, which is both A and C, sexual harassment and staff misconduct. Um, and that is the correct answer. So Lewis is experiencing sexual harassment by staff, and that also falls under the category of staff misconduct. Also important is that he's being harassed by other inmates as a direct result of the harassment by staff. Note that the writer is being targeted because of his sexual orientation, which could be a major part of his trauma experience. The searches may fall into the category of sexual abuse, although it's difficult to know this without more information from Lewis about what exactly is happening during the searches. So it's important to not underestimate the power of emotional support, even if no other support is available. It can be enough to tell someone you believe them and that it's not their fault. If you're unsure of your ability to provide institutional advocacy or at what level, talk with your team and your supervisor. Similarly, research any information or questions related to PREA before you respond to ensure the information you provide is applicable. Occasionally, rape crisis centers may receive letters from inmates that are not relevant to the services you can provide. The request can be for a resource that's not related to sexual abuse, such as legal support for a criminal case, or maybe reentry services. Research what programs may be available in your community so that you can make the appropriate referrals. Later in the webinar, we will talk more specifically about off-topic letters and how to respond. So we have another letter exercise. This is the second part of the, the first letter. So as I read this part, please listen closely for what the writer is seeking. I feel like, prison is, I feel like the prison is not supposed to let this happen. I was reading about Priya, but I don't know if Priya is for me because what's happening to me isn't right, but it still feels wrong. I want to speak up but I'm worried something worse will happen if I do. Everyone knows everyone's business here, and if I say something, everyone will know about it. I don't know what I can do. It's starting to really get to me. I get scared to talk to people and like there's no one here I can trust. I can't relax, and it's hard for me to sleep. I feel like I gotta keep one eye open always. I don't know what you can do for me either, but anything you can do would be a blessing. So we're gonna do another poll. Um, so based on what you just heard, what support or what service is this writer seeking? A, emotional support, B, institutional advocacy, C, general information, or D, off-topic support?
Wonderful. So it looks like most people, 69%, put emotional support. Um, and this is a challenging one. It, it can be challenging to determine exactly one thing that this writer in particular is seeking. However, we can see in the letter that he definitely needs some more information about PREA and whether PREA applies to him, what his rights are. Letting survivors know their options and legal rights is a major part of the work of advocacy, particularly within an institutional setting. In crafting the response letter, you could inform him that what he is experiencing is sexual harassment and that it falls under PREA and that he has the right to support from an advocate and that you can and that and he can report the harassment if he chooses. The response letter could outline options for the survivor, including any advocacy directly with the institution your organization could provide, such as contacting the institution's PREA coordinator. It's important to get the survivor's permission before making any further steps. In any response, however, it is important to validate the survivor's feelings and experiences and to let them know it's not their fault. Thank you so much for participating. We're going to shift things back to Bo to talk more about responding to letters from incarcerated survivors. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> if you're receiving few letters, you can respond to them as you receive them. But if you start receiving more letters, you can use the screening process that Jessica talked about in detail in this last section, um, which boils down to prioritizing by safety needs. At JDI, we screen letters to prioritize response and always respond to those who disclose that they have been sexually abused while incarcerated immediately. Even if the letter writer doesn't seem to be in immediate danger or a, um, an extreme crisis, it's important to respond in a timely manner. While it is important to respond as soon as you can, from our experience at JDI, responding within one or two weeks is, realistic type, is a realistic time frame. During that time frame, um, you may get several letters from the same person. You don't need to respond to each letter. It's okay to write one letter that addresses all their issues. The tone of the letter to a prisoner is also important. Special efforts should be made to express care and concern for the survivor's emotional and physical health. In many detention facilities, harsh, overbearing language is the norm, especially from staff. You can express your support and care for them by using phrases like, I'm glad you contacted us, and I'm sorry to hear about what happened to you. A few kind words can go a long way towards establishing trust with an incarcerated survivor and helping that person feel less alone. It is okay to create templates to provide general information about your services. However, when providing emotional support through written correspondence, it is important that you personalize your response. The longer you correspond with a person, the more personalized your letters will be. You can do this by reflecting back on some of the language and sentiment that they used in their letters to you. You can also do this by addressing them by name and hand signing the letters. Use words to show that you appreciate that they wrote you. Acknowledge that it was a brave, brave thing for them to do and express care and concern for them. You may be the only person who is letting them know that they matter. Provide basic information about trauma and sexual assault when necessary and normalize their, their thoughts, feelings, and experiences so they know that they're not alone. Um, it is very common for survivors to feel alone, and this is especially true for people who are incarcerated for whom it may be unsafe to share their feelings and experiences with others. When you engage in safety planning, take into account the survivor's potential resources as well as the possible risk, risks they face. A prisoner knows what to do to keep himself safe. You can be there to reflect the pros and cons. It is helpful to become familiar with the survivor's rights outlined in the PREA standards and become familiar with the institution's PREA policy and how they are, implemented, uh, how they are implementing the standard. More specifically, it is very important to familiarize yourself with the corrections agency's reporting process. Under the PREA standards, the institution must provide ways to report sexual abuse in writing anonymously to a third party and to an outside agency. Please note, JDI doesn't recommend that local rape crisis centers serve as a reporting agency. If someone does disclose to you that they were sexually abused, remember that you are not required to report to the corrections agency. You must abide by your state's confidentiality laws and agency policies, no matter where your client lives. 
If the survivor is asking you to make a report for them, you should write back immediately asking them to sign an informed consent form. <clears throat> Adapt the information you share with the survivors for their current environment. If you share ideas for coping skills, understand that while someone can't take a bath, they can stand in the shower and notice how the water hits them. It may provide a private place for them to cry. Uh, they can't sit in a park, but they might be able, be able to walk on the rec field. They might be able to join some kind of craft class to express themselves, or they can do guided visualizations, meditation, exercise, and listen to music, or read or other things that they can do that are self-contained in their self. Try to provide referrals to organizations that you have relationships with or have already talked to so you know that they are accessible to prisoners. Um, this will save them the time, money, emotion, and hassle of unnecessary rejection. Provide disclaimers about the information and referrals as you do with survivors in the community. Survivors need us while they are inside, and then again once they are released. You can provide information on your program services or other Rape Crisis Center program services if the person you are working with is going to be released soon. It is important to remember that 95% of people who are incarcerated return to the community. Um, the resources list on the screen are resources that JDI provides to survivors as part of, a, of, as part of a larger packet of information. You can download them from the links at the end of the webinar. Make sure all the material you provide is created so that anyone, regardless of who they are, feel that it is designed for them. Remember to use simple, clear language and a respectful tone. Try to design your material at an eighth grade reading level. Use larger fonts because many prisoners may not have the proper eyeglass prescriptions and it may be difficult for them to see smaller font. Develop material and languages that are common to your state. If you can create a pamphlet that is specific for prisoners and the institution in your service area, it may seem small, but this will show that your, your organization cares about the people in that institution. Include symbols that show inclusivity. Include LGBTQ symbols and symbols of diversity. So even if the advocates are not LGBT, people of color, or people with disabilities, they know that your agency is welcoming to everyone. Finally, if you use images, be sure that they reflect the people you currently serve as well as the people you intend to serve. A man who is incarcerated may not know that your services are available to him. If you have the word woman in the name of your organization and you only have photos of women throughout your outreach material. A woman who has a life sentence may not know that you provide services to women like her if your material only talks about in-person services at your center. Your organization may decide to put together a packet of information for survivors. You may consider including a recommended reading list that you already use with survivors that you work with in the community. Prisoners generally spend a lot of time reading. So any books that you can recommend that are about trauma and healing can be very helpful, especially for those can, um, that contain self-contained exercises. We have included our recommended reading list that you can access in the handout section. Feel free to adapt and add to, the, add to this list. Also, keep in mind, prisoners can't order books from Amazon but many can access books from the prison library, and there are also prison book programs that prisoners may have access to. When sending letters, it is important to follow all institutional rules. The prison may have very different rules from a jail or a juvenile facility. If you are coordinating your program with the institution, you can get information about their mailing regulations from the PREA coordinator, your contact or the people who run the mailroom. If the staff in the mailroom know who you are and what you are doing and feel included in the process, they are more likely to help you down the road if there are any issues. If you are writing survivors directly without coordinating with the institution, you can often find the facility's mailing regulations on their website. Even if you do not have a written agreement with the institution, you can still be very helpful um, if you 
can make contact with their mailroom. Once you learn the facility's rules, be sure to follow them to the T. You don't want to have any important letters kicked back because you used staples or cardstock or colored paper or because you didn't include the prisoner's institutional number or last name. It is best to practice to it is best practice, I'm sorry, to deliver inmate correspondence via confidential legal mail. Rate crisis centers that provide legal advocacy and information or that partner with an attorney or legal assistant group may qualify for legal mail status. Confidential mail is typically, typically opened in the presence of the inmate and is not pre-screened by correction staff. Some rape crisis centers have agreements with correctional facilities to permit, uh, that permit them to write the inmate via confidential mail, even though they do not provide legal services. Other corrections agencies maintain a list of victim service agencies that are pre-approved for legal mail status. It may be useful for advocates to contact local corrections facilities about this option to ensure that incarcerated survivors can send mail to their agency as confidentially as possible. Now I'm going to introduce you to Kalinda. Kalinda is a 29-year-old bisexual woman incarcerated in Kentucky for a nonviolent offense. She is a survivor of sexual abuse at two different facilities in that state. Um, in both cases, her attacker was a staff member. Letter 1 is dated 12-29-2010. Hello. My name is Kalinda. You sent me a packet of information about JDI. I'm very thankful for this information. However, I was actually wondering if you can find a local attorney to take the prison rape case, or if you could guide me in the right direction to get the ball rolling to seek justice before it's too late. Anything you can do to help would be much appreciated. Sincerely, Kalinda. Then we have a second letter from Kalinda. And it's dated 12-19-2011. I appreciate you and JDI's fight for justice. I was wondering if you knew if I could still press charges or sue the county jail or prison if the rape sexual assaults took place in 2007, 2009, and 2010. Also, if you have any extra folder uh, with JDI info in it, can you send me one? My bunkie has been assaulted and is scared to ask for one herself for fear that her rapist may see it come in. Thank you for your help. And then letter three, dated 1-27-2014. I wish I could say things are better, but they've gone from bad to worse. I need a new packet of JDI information. I'm in the hole without access to the one you sent me. Also, I'm in the hole for reporting sexual harassment for a friend of mine. She could use your info as well. Thanks. Kalinda. So, I have a question for the audience. Um, how, how did Kalinda advocate for herself? Submit your answers in the question box. How do you feel that she advocated for herself? She's asking for information. She gave, um, she made her, her needs very clear. She wrote JDI for information. She asked for information. She reached out and she told her story. She requested information, information. Um, she asked for what she needs. She asked for information. She reported. Um, she gave dates and times of the incident. Um, yes, thank you um, for participating. Um, so we have a poll. How would you respond to Kalinda? Oh, okay. Here we go. Awesome. All right, so um, the majority of everybody said to provide information and referrals, um, and then the next thing was describe the services and develop empathy. Everybody is correct. This is this is great. Kalinda may be asking for services outside your scope when um, she asked for assistance filing 
uh, finding an attorney, but then you could respond by giving her a list of attorneys that may be able to help her. Um, you may not be an expert on statute of limitations. Um, you could, however, refer her to a source where she can find that information or send it to her um, uh, or send her the information directly. Thank you for participating. Um, we will now hear from Jessica about some common challenges. Thank you, Bo. Um, as in all other areas of life, each individual person's experience will be quite different from anyone else's. But what we do know is what incarcerated survivors need from us at its core is the same that any other survivor needs from us. That is not to say that working with incarcerated survivors doesn't come with its own set of challenges based on the closed systems in which they live and the lack of resources, including the lack of even basic necessities such as healthy food, toilet paper, tampons, and cleaning supplies. Anytime you are working with an incarcerated survivor in any capacity, confidentiality is always a challenge. Whenever possible, you should get permission from a survivor before forwarding a letter to the corrections agency. However, as discussed earlier, there may be some situations in which advocates need to make exceptions to confidentiality. For example, JDI regularly receives letters from survivors who threaten to hurt themselves or someone else or who describe an imminent threat to their safety. Rape Crisis Center should decide how to respond to such letters on a case-by-case -case basis. Try to avoid repeating specific information about the survivor's abuse experience in case your letter is read. For example, if a survivor writes that C.O. Smith raped them, do not include C.O. Smith's name in your response. Also, do not do any institutional advocacy that could compromise a survivor's confidentiality without express permission. If a survivor asks you to write a letter to the warden or PREA coordinator on their behalf, ask the survivor what information is okay to include or not include before doing this. This will take a bit longer, but will show your commitment to empowering that survivor, which can have a huge impact. It's important to handle documentation for incarcerated survivors as you would with any other client. Many organizations have policies around how to write case notes, particularly as it concerns protecting clients' confidentiality. Some organizations may decide to keep letters from incarcerated survivors separate from case notes. Decide as a team what makes the most sense for your organization. Many agencies experience off-topic or potentially harassing calls on their crisis lines, and written correspondence is no different. Some people who are incarcerated are desperate for any support and will write to a number of organizations, regardless of whether their needs are specific to that organization's mission. A writer, of, a writer could be a survivor of abuse, but is asking for legal help around their criminal case. Some letters may be requests for books or articles, pen pal services, or referrals for re-entry programs. Your organization can develop a template letter to respond to these letters, outlining your services and service limitations. It is also possible that some advocates may receive letters that are explicit in detail of abusive incidents or otherwise inappropriate for your agency. Some survivors may disclose their criminal histories, and it is possible this criminal history could include sexual violence perpetration. As rape crisis advocates, it is outside your role to provide support or treatment around someone's use of violence, particularly sexual violence. It is possible, however, to provide emotional support around the trauma of sexual abuse without validating or excusing violent choices. As with any of the work that advocates do, providing written correspondence to incarcerated survivors is emotionally challenging. I found that I initially underestimated the impact written correspondence would have on me when I was an advocate. I assumed that writing would be less distressing than crisis line calls or in-person support. However, written correspondence presented unique challenges that I did not anticipate. It sometimes left me feeling powerless to help, and the delays in writing back and forth were very stressful. I'm going to talk about some of the things that helped me take care of myself while I was doing this important work. It may take some time to read, process, and respond to a letter from an incarcerated survivor, and that's okay. Sometimes a response later letter may take several drafts before you're able to complete it. This can help you avoid overwhelm and can also benefit the survivor by ensuring your response is the most thoughtful and thorough it can be. Although responding as soon as possible is recommended, it's also important that you are present when writing your response. Boundaries are an essential component of any advocate's self-care. 
This goes beyond understanding what services you can and cannot offer. It also speaks to the limits of an advocate's ability to ensure full safety and dignity for a survivor. Incarcerated survivors may be facing human rights violations separate from sexual abuse that are beyond our capacity to immediately address. Rape crisis centers can make changes in an institution's culture and can help make incarcerated people safer, but this takes time and is usually done in small steps. Keeping this in mind, you can help manage your own expectations along with the expectations of the survivors you are working with. Take advantage of the resources available within your organization for self-care as well. Connect with your fellow advocates or dedicate time in supervision sessions or team meetings to process difficult letters. We often hear from advocates who may be the only person in their organization working with incarcerated survivors. This can make it difficult to receive needed support from colleagues. It's likely there are advocates at other organizations that would be available to help provide support and could also use support from others. In order to do this work sustainably, it is important to not be isolated. Any advocate can email us at JDI and we can facilitate a connection with an advocate near you. At the end of this webinar, we will provide the email address in order to include yourself in a network of advocates providing support to each other. In addition, there will be an option in our post-webinar survey to include yourself in our database of advocates available for support. I'm going to turn things over to Desiree to go over some of your questions. Oh, thank you, Jessica and Bo. Um, and now a couple questions from the audience. Um, okay, so I have one here that says, maybe this might be for you, Jessica. Um, what do we do about prisoners who are not literate? That's that's a really great question. Um, in my experience, I think working with youth has really helped me in that regard, because um, it's important to try to make, to write the language so that it's most accessible to as many people, if that makes sense. I'm not sure if that's a really good response to that question, but I know that that's something that's, that's helped me in that regard. Okay. Um, so we have another question. If your only option for correspondence is a postcard, how do you manage? This is going to be maybe for Bo? Um, that is definitely um, a hard question. Um, so we do get um, mail that is just postcards and that's all they can receive. Um, and we have tried to connect with a legal source so that they can receive legal mail and that's that way we can um, correspond more openly and on a full sheet of paper. Um, uh, it would be best, I think, to connect with the correctional institution as well as their mail room and see if the, you cannot work something out where your mail is considered legal mail. Um, how is postage funded, personal, or by the organization? It's not for either of you. <laughs> how is postage funded? I. Uh, I guess I'm wondering if by organization, does that mean the Rape Crisis Center or does that mean the detention facility? Okay. Uh, by the center, the organization is the clarification. Um, okay. Oh, I see. Okay, sorry. Um, I. That's actually a question I'm, I'm not sure the answer to. In, in my experience, we've always, in rape crisis centers that I've worked in, we've always just had funding for, um, for things like stamps. Um, it's never really, it's, ha it's not been an issue that's been presented to me yet. I don't know if anyone else on, on the webinar has some more insight on that. Okay. No, I think this is similar, I have a similar experience. Um, so we have another question. Sometimes we receive large volumes of documentation which can be hard to understand um, and we don't, we're unsure as to what the survivor is asking for. Is this a common experience and how can we handle such a situation? Um, yes, a very common experience. There's a lot of times that we get letters um, from survivors who are 
all over the board as far as their requests. Um, a lot of the things are outside of the scope. What I look for is um, if the person has disclosed that they've been um, sexually assaulted or sexually harassed, um, or if they're just looking for information. And then I send them an information packet that basically tells them what it is we're about and what it is we can offer. Um, usually, I will get a letter back from that person, and they'll um, most likely disclose, and then I send them a packet. Great, thank you. Um, so you mentioned a signed signature. Should letters be handwritten or typed, or does it matter? Um, letters are typed. I think that's um, a lot more efficient. Um, however, we make sure that we hand sign every letter, um, and we also hand sign um, the envelopes that go to them um, because an in, uh, a, a prisoner knows that it takes time to do that, and it just seems a lot more personal. Okay. Uh, can a correspondence program be started for use only? Yeah, I, I think so. I've, I've done correspondence with youth before. Um, obviously, you know, there's some confidentiality issues that, that come in when working with, with youth, and I think as long as the youth are, you know, really aware of what those limitations are, um, correspondence can absolutely be done with youth as well. Okay. Um, how often does correspondence turn into jail visits? I would say that depends on, on a number of things. Um, in, in my experience, it depends on whether or not that service is being asked for, right? Um, it also depends on that center's capacity to do that. So for example, some facilities may be several hours away, and so it, you know, it may depend on um, the availability or the capacity to send an advocate there. Um, it also depends on whether or not that's even a service that an organization is able to, to offer and how far away that facility is. So I guess my answer is it depends. Okay. Um, where did you say that we could find guidelines if a person expressed suicide? So each rape crisis center should have their own guidelines or on how to respond to that. And then different states also have different uh, regulations around uh, reporting uh, mandated reporting statutes, and so it would really depend on the individual center and then what state that center is in and what those those regulations have to say. Okay, um, and so we have a comment from Sarah Herman who was responding to uh, the question about uh, who pays for the, the, the fees, um, like for the stamps, and somebody, and she said, um, we charge PREA our state email expenses, or our state mail expenses, uh, county and federal do not reimburse at this time. So just wanted to share that sentiment with folks. Um, so we have another question. Um, is it your experience that institutions read an inmate's mail? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> any mail that comes that is not legal mail, they are, it is part of their job to scan letters. Um, and you do have um, issues with uh, certain prisoners that feel that they're being retaliated against by an officer, and that officer um, will sit and read their mail. So um, it's required um, to scan them, but sometimes they go a little b above and beyond and will sit down and read letters word for word. Great. Um, I haven't dealt with letters so much. I received a letter from an individual who was in need of mental health in the prison and said that he had been moved to, sorry, he had been moved to, and in order to ensure that I got him the help that he, he needed, I called the facility to speak to the mental health professional in the facility to ensure that he was receiving the help that he needed. Was this appropriate? Um, yes, we have, um, um, when we receive mail of um, especially suicide uh, mail where they have specific, specifically um, written out exactly what they are going to do, we um, call the institution as well to make sure that they're okay. Um, uh, we have had um, letters where there are mental health issues and the person's been transferred and we seriously are worried about their well-being and we have called mm -hmm. the institution. So yeah, that was the right thing to do. Yeah, I think that's great advocacy. Good job. 
Okay, so we see multiple clients in the same facility will share our letters with each other. Is this common? Are there, are, is there any special considerations when we know the group of inmates are reading what we send to one client? I think that a lot of times prisoners do share um, their mail with other people. Um, we have had prisoners, um, like in Kalinda's story, um, can you please send a packet to my friend because they're afraid. So you know that they're sharing information. Um, as long as it's between them and there's no issue with that, that's fine. Um, when we send mail, we send it to a specific person. If they choose to share it, that's, that's their decision. Great, thank you. Um, how would we address letters from institutions that our agency doesn't respond to or don't fall under the PREA standards because it's not a CDCR institution? So, um, I, so this is probably related to a project we're working on specifically in California. So um, any detention facility falls under the PREA standards, whether it's a state prison or a county jail, um, they, they all fall under the PREA standards. And so any rape crisis center can can respond to um, a letter from any survivor, any incarcerated survivor anywhere. I hope that answers that question. Uh, what if it's not officially classified as legal mail, but is stamped that it's not to be read? But it's OK. Um, OK, it's officially classified as legal mail, and it stamped and it shouldn't be read. Um, no, no, no. Um, it's, it's, sorry, just to clarify, what, if it's not officially classified as legal mail, but it has been stamped uh, that it shouldn't be read. I don't know um, okay, so like you're saying confidential correspondence, but it's not legal mail. Yes. Um, anything that shows confident, a stamp that shows any kind of confidential um, mail, but they have a list in the mail room of who is considered legal mail and or confidential mail. If you are not on that list, um, they will open the letter. They will also send probably you a letter stating that your mail is not confidential, um, and they will call that inmate to the mail room to s receive the mail after it's been opened and read and told that it's not confidential. So probably it's best not to uh, stamp mail that's not considered uh, legal mail confidential or if you don't have some kind of agreement with the agency. Correct. Okay. Um, how, how do we know that there will not be retaliation for disclosing or reporting sexual harassment by corrections officers or staff? How do we know that they're safe? Oh, this, this is a really tough question and this is, this is kind of one of those things where we, we can't ever really no, like we, we just can't and that's I think very difficult for those of us who are you know in this field to, to not be able to really ensure a survivor's safety is, is something that's, that's very, very difficult. Um, the best that we can do is the best that we can do and unfortunately it's not, it's not that much because we, we absolutely can't guarantee that someone won't be retaliated against even though retaliation is you know a violation of, of of PREA standards, but unfortunately there's nothing, we can't guarantee that. I don't know, if Bo, if you want to add to that. Well, I, I just want to say that um, most of your prisoners know what to do to keep themselves safe, even if it means sending themselves to solitary confinement. Um, when there is a staff re retaliation, um, prisoners will band together to help each other out, so they do know how to take care of themselves, um, to keep themselves as safe as possible. All we can do is, is encourage them and support whatever decisions they made. Thank you, Bo. Um, okay, uh, could you talk about any special considerations concerning correspondence when the perpetrator is a staff member? I think uh, what Bo said for the last question actually really covers a lot of, of this one as well. Yeah. Make sure that you never repeat that staff member's name when you are writing them back. Um, and a lot of times prisoners, like I said, if, if, 
if the worst place to go is to solitary confinement, they would do that. Um, a lot of times they might be able to transfer and move to another unit um, where it would be unusual to see that staff in that area, which if they are retaliating against them, then that gives the prisoner actually um, a little more uh, credence to what they're saying. This person shouldn't be here, but they're always here. So, um, like I said, inmates know how to, to, to make themselves safe. Um. So, sorry, if I, maybe you could clarify if I'm not answer, or asking this question correctly, but who is official to read the mail? I guess who is officially allowed to read the mail um, other than the mailroom personnel? Your mailroom sergeant um, can read the mail, and the mail can also be scanned by whoever the officer is on that unit. So the mail goes through several hands before it makes it to that prisoner. Um, usually, um, through CDCR, the screening process was usually the mailroom, and then another screening process through the unit officer. And that might be different from facility to facility, so you might also want to follow up right. with whatever agency you're working with. Um, okay. Uh, what? What can we offer to survivors when they feel they are experiencing retaliation through officers? Um, I, you, understanding, uh, um, you know, using um, language that shows them support and asking them what options they feel they have. Because a lot of times, if you're under stress and you're afraid, you, you're you not thinking of all your options. And sometimes if someone asks you, what can you do, then it opens up your mind and you're allowed to, you know, think a little more outside the box. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so should our center be on the confidential list before we continue correspondence or before they disclose? I would, I would say that you know if if an incarcerated survivor is writing you a letter, they they have a really good understanding of what confidentiality means in in that facility, probably more than we would. And so, I would continue to do correspondence while also working on working with that facility to get your center on that confidential list, um, while also, of course, you know, letting folks know kind of what the confidentiality limitations are, but I, I would bet that folks already know and are, and are writing anyway, which I think is really important. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have seen numerous victims taken to shoe to keep them safe after an assault. However, they feel they're being punished for an assault and in essence are being punished. There doesn't seem to be a consistent person for the victim to talk to and everyone has different answers. If the pre-compliance person isn't a safe option, who else should this person talk to? So this is a problem that we encounter on a regular basis. Um, yes, sending a victim to SHU is another is creating more victimology. It's um, it's not the right thing to do because sitting in prison in a cell by yourself um, with no one coming to see you makes it even worse. Um, that's where I feel the advocate um, is most needed because they're going to send that person to solitary confinement pending investigation for their so-called own safety, um, which in a lot of cases, if their um, perpetrator is a staff, basically it's isolated that person and made them even uh, more of a target. Um, and if the PREA compliance manager isn't working, that's where um, we offer a list of other places that the victim can write um, as far as your um, internal affairs, um, it's getting outside of the prison and um, writing, um, the, the, writing the state. Um, the OIG, I mean, you, you, there's a lot of other places to write to, um, 
but this is a really, really hard thing. I mean, this is part of what um, we're trying to um, work out with uh, institutions um, to not lock these people up. Um, but also find their safety. That's where a lot of um, institutions are now having like safe yards um, where these people are put into protective housing, which is not um, considerably a lockdown. Um, but unfortunately, not all institutions have that. And so the best place for them to put this person is in solitary confinement. And that's where, as an advocate, um, to just reiterate that the person, you know, they're trying to keep you safe. These are places you can go and, and you know, and and listen to them. Just hear them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I receive calls via hotline from all over the state. If the same individuals decide to write and I am not in their area, will I handle referrals the same way I do uh, with the calls? Yeah, this I, um, in my advocacy days, I would definitely receive letters from all over the place that weren't necessarily in my agency's service area, and so I would I would have responded with information about what you know what organizations may be closer to them. Um, so I, I would say yeah to to handle those referrals similarly. Okay. Um, is it common practice to not use your true name? I'm in a small area, but the regional jail is seven miles away. Um, uh, that I think oh. is, um, I, I think that's your decision. Um, if you feel more comfortable, like just using your last name or using another name, that's fine. Um, whatever makes you feel comfortable um, with us, we do use our real name. And also with us, we pretty much only use one person or one or two staff members name, even though it might be several different staff responding, just for clear. Um, okay, if, sorry, if inmates are the ones working in the mail room, how do you ensure that the perpetrator will not get a hold of the survivor's incoming letters, which can put the survivor at more risk? Legally, an inmate cannot work in the mail room around mail. Um, if there are inmates in the mail room, it's like for janitorial services um, or something um, like that. But inmates usually are not a allowed around all the mail, so I don't see where that would be happening. Um, I heard you say to weigh the survivor's privacy and confidentiality against the risk and safety needs in case of suicidality, causing harm to someone else, being harmed in the facility, um, or mental health. Is this message meant for mandatory reporters or also for advocates who have privilege or mandated by funding to be confidential? I, I would say that this is for, for all advocates and that, you know, different, in my experience, different centers have different policies around around breaking confidentiality and that we want to apply, you know, whatever those policies are, whatever those limitations are to incarcerated survivors the same way we would with survivors in the community, whether a staff person is a mandated reporter or not. Okay. And I think um, that's most of the questions. If we don't have any other questions, there's one additional one, but it kind of transitions us into the next section. So if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to close this question section. Okay. Um, can I just make one comment? Yes. Um, I would just like to say thank you to all of you um, from my brothers and sisters that are still incarcerated. Mm -hmm. um, as a returned citizen and an incarcerated survivor, I know the differences you can make. Um, and the healing that you provide to so many incarcerated survivors. So I just want you all to know that you're heroes. Thank you, Bo. Okay. Um, so we have a question that's asking about um, providing uh, what you, you mentioned, providing a packet of material. Um, and can you talk more about that? So we have some of the material. Um, 
So, so much of what we discussed today, um, including a sample response letter uh, to a survivor, I think somebody might have asked about templates, is included in the JDI publication, Hope Behind Bars, an Advocate's Guide to Helping Survivors of Sexual Abuse Behind Bars. This guide is free and can be found on the Advocate Resource section of JDI's website. We certainly encourage you to download the guide for future reference and do share it with your colleagues. Um, so we also have an end to silence is one of the pieces of material that we also include in these packets and you could find that online. Um, we also have um, protecting your health and safety, a litigation guide for inmates. Um, and we also have some other material so feel free to contact us that we, that we can share with you all. Um, and then, you know, we have our advocate resources uh, section, so you can just look at that for additional material. Um, and then if you have any questions or technical, uh, technical support, you can always uh, contact us at advocate at justdetention.org and we'll get back to you. Uh, we also encourage you to visit the advocate resources page on our website for more archived webinars on a variety of topics for different fact sheets and tools like sample MOUs. Um, and that link is to justattention.org slash advocate resources. Um, and then JDI has a resource guide for survivors of sexual abuse behind bars, which is a guide that lists legal and psychological counseling resources by state. Survivors, uh, for survivors who are still incarcerated, those who have been released, and the loved ones on the outside who are searching for ways to help. If your agency is interested in being listed, or if you could please update your listing, um, on the resource guide, please fill out the form uh, found on the link to on your screen. We will also include the link in your follow-up email today. Um, our next webinar will be upholding your principles, strategies for protecting confidentiality for incarcerated survivors on Thursday, July 14th. In that webinar, we'll talk. Uh, we'll have a brief uh, We'll have a brief description. You can register um, at the link. Um, and we will send out in registration information by email soon. And finally, thank you so much for joining us today. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation and provide us with your feedback. The link to the evaluation is on the slide here and you will also receive it in a short email today. And then on the screen you'll find more information if you need to get in touch with us. Again, email advocate at justdetention.org if you would like to be connected to other advocates near you. Thank you again so much for joining us. And as Bo said, you are all heroes. Thank you for doing this work.